No. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm working in the core database team at DataStax. We are a database vendor, and we're working on the best uh, available distribution of Apache Cassandra. And um, the title of this talk, uh, what we talk about when we talk about on-disk storage, was uh, originally inspired by Haruki Murakami's book, when, What We Talk About When We Talk About Running. Did anybody read it or see it? OK, nobody. And uh, after that, a friend of mine, Alvaro Vidala, he did the talk, which was called What We Talk About When We Talk About um, Distributed Systems. And uh, I thought, OK, this is really cool, and we have to have the same thing just for disk storage. And uh, um, the subject of disk storage is actually huge. And uh, it was kind of somewhat difficult for me to pick up the exact subject. And the main reason uh, to give this talk is that, well, first of all, the amounts of data processed uh, by the applications every day are constantly growing. And with this growth, the um, Picking the storage becomes more challenging, and actually scaling it also. And because every database uh, system and storage one has its own trade-offs, understanding them becomes extremely crucial, because it helps you to pick the right tool for the right job. This talk tries to summarize the modern practices, because the new, like over the last several years, there were so many new developments that open up a lot of opportunities. I'm going to try to build up the vocabulary for you to be able to navigate through the well sea of the things that you can find out there. And I will, of course, point to the worthy sources so that you could uh, cross-check and verify everything that I'm saying. I have tried to summarize the uh, material helping to understand the database and storage system building blocks, at least on the very, so, so to say, bottom level, so the closest to the file system. And uh, this is going to be kind of under the hood peak for the operators running databases and developers building applications around them. And this subject is definitely not an easy one because like, there are so many building blocks and so many nuances out there. But um, I will try to be objective and mostly state the facts and not to go into the speculations and telling what's better and what's worth. It was uh, kind of difficult to pick exactly what, uh, what I'm going to talk about, so uh, I ended up writing, uh, well, going through lots of material and released everything I'm going to be talking about uh, as a series of blog posts. So it turned out to be like maybe 15 minutes of uh, reading time, so you can imagine it's like a lot of things to go through. And uh, the blog posts also include uh, the subjects of uh, file systems, and uh, like different uh, approaches to doing I.O., the optimizations that people do on the database layer. And I will show you the link in the end of the presentation. If you would like to learn more about the subject, you can just go there and read more. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to start with concentrating on uh, the two major data storage approaches. Before we dig into it, let's start with some terminology. Uh, one of the most important things to talk about when you pick the storage system is the access pattern. Because it's going to pick or it's going to put a cap on your abilities and performance of your system. And we often start by distinguishing between random and sequential I.O. access patterns. By sequential access, we usually mean um, reading contiguous blocks of memory going monotonically from lower offsets to the higher ones. Random access can, in fact, also be going from the lower offsets to the higher ones, but it doesn't read the contiguous blocks of memory. It is, uh, of course, random because it is uh, impossible to predict. And sequential implies, um, or sequential writes, imply that we're um, also writing the continu contiguous blocks of memory without issuing any seeks for the file system in between. For CPU and operating system, sequential me usually means predictable, and there will be, therefore, less cache misses and because prefetching can be done, for instance. It is also important to remember that sequential writes do not always result into sequential reads, and data written closely doesn't necessarily, um, is not necessarily guaranteed to be read together. Sequential reads are mostly um, used when reading large contiguous blocks of memory or data, for instance, log or range scans. 
but how do we actually achieve sequential access? How do we optimize or guarantee that? In order to be able to write your data sequentially, you often have to buffer it. So you just keep it in memory until you, you have enough things to write, and then you flush it all together in one go on disk. And in order to prepare your data for sequential reads, you have to lay it out sequentially uh, by pre-sorting. And uh, another important concept uh, on, in, on disk storage is mutability or immutability of the data structures that you're using. This is also, has also significant implications for the disk layout, general process of data structure construction, and maintenance processes, and we will definitely go into more details later. The mutable data structures usually pre-allocate memory. <coughs> um, they usually pre-allocate memory and do, well, in-place updates for the data that they manage. This usually results into lots of random I.O., especially when you do writes. Since the updates are made in place, um, there is no shadowing required. Here, by shadowing, I mean uh, reading from multiple sources and trying to resolve the conflicts before returning the data to the client. And concurrent accesses and modifications have to be guarded by complex systems of locks and latches. Immutable data structure requires some memory buffering. For that, they can guarantee that writes are going to be sequential. Because of the immutability and the fact that uh, files are not modified on disk, this may require reading from multiple sources and merging this. This is the shadowing that I just mentioned. Now, let's just contrast these two things, the immutable and immutable data structures, and random and sequential I.O., and take a look at several storage design systems or storage system designs that take these two approaches uh, slightly differently. The first thing that we're going to take a look at are log structured merge trees. Anybody is familiar with the concept? OK, that's good. The LSM trees, or log structured merge trees, is an immutable disk resident data structure, meaning that it lives on the disk. So it's less about the on memory stuff. In memory stuff, it's more about things that are uh, going on, on disk. And it is optimized for sequential writes and maintaining, while maintaining the acceptable read performance. LSM trees have been getting more attention recently because they can eliminate random I.O. on inserts and uh, uh, updates and delete operations, and because, well, they are in some ways friendlier for the modern um, storage systems such as SSDs. And uh, um, in order to allow sequential writes, LSM trees batch up writes and updates in memory resident table, so you can uh, see the little triangle over there. It is often implemented using a data structure that allows logarithmic uh, time lookups and inserts, such as binary search tree or a skip list. It uh, whenever its size reaches a cer certain threshold, it is written on disk in a process which is called flush. Retrieving the data requires searching all these disk resident parts of the tree, checking a memory table, and then merging their contents together before the returning the result. The disk resident tables are, um, and their files are immutable. So whenever they're written on disk, they're not touched anymore. So you will not come back and try to modify and change them. They can only be deleted, so this is the only thing. Well, of course, they can be read from, but other than that, only deleted. So you cannot really modify them at all. As you can see, the LSM storage converts, uh, quote unquote, random writes into sequential um, by means of buffering. Many modern LSM implementations, such as, for instance, RocksDB, which is actually used by many other databases, or Apache Cassandra, uh, choose the sorted string tables file format, or so-called SS tables, because of its simplicity. It's easier to write, read to read, in actually trivial to implement. So SS tables are persistent, immutable maps from, well, keys to values, where keys and values some are some arbitrary uh, byte strings. Every value in a SS table usually has a timestamp associated with it. Um, it specifies write time for insert and updates. By the way, inserts and updates are often indistinguishable in these storage systems. And for deletes, this is uh, specifying 
the deletion time. Structurally, SS tables are split in two, data, uh, in two parts. One of them is index block, and the second one is the data block. Index block contains uh, keys mapped to the offsets of the um, data blocks, pointing where the actual data is located on the disk, well, within the data block. Index is often implemented using a format that can give you a good lookup guarantees, so, such as, for instance, B-tree, uh, or for point queries, you can use something like a hash table. Uh, and data block is usually consisting of the sequentially written key, uh, key value pairs, just like appended one after another, one after another. And uh, each key obviously appears only once. And this whole kind of design and the fact that uh, these are sorted string tables open up some opportunities or give us several very nice properties. For instance, the point queries, uh, which means finding a value by the key, can be done pretty quickly by just searching the index and then locating the data by the row offset and then returning it to the client. And the sequential scans can be done by locating the uh, data in the index first, and then go into the data block and then scanning sequentially until you have reached the end of, uh, of, the, of your range. And um, we will also ex explore several things which are extremely helpful, or so which are utilizing, the, for instance, the fact that sequential scans are so good. And logically, SS tables represent a snapshot of all database operations over a certain period in time. Uh, as the SS table is created by the uh, flush operation that we just talked about, the pro um, it's uh, kind of like whenever the mem table, which was buffering the data, got flushed and we got the SS table, so therefore it's a snapshot of the data. And um, as we discussed, so the in order to read things from LSM storage, you have to perform a a uh, process called merge, and whenever you are trying to well combine many SS tables into one, you can also utilize uh, the merge sort process. Um, in order to merge multiple SS tables, so kind of like whenever you have too many of those, you can sequentially scan through each one in the lockstep, while uh, advancing iterators while maintaining the heap or something like that of the searched heads of the iterators. Then you perform in-memory merge, similarly to what MergeSir does, and then you're writing the results sequentially back on disk, also sequentially. And the best thing about it, or best part about it, is that you only need the O of N of additional space for that, where N is just an amount of SS tables. So basically, per SS table, you would only hold, during the merge process, the last record in it. From a data standpoint, merge is reconciling records from multiple sources. Records usually have a key and a timestamp associated with them. For instance, one of the uh, SS table records uh, has a later timestamp, so the previous uh, data point with the same key is just going to be discarded. In order to support deletes, SS tables is using something called dormant certificates or tombstones. They indicate that a record with a certain key has been removed. So during the merge process, the record shadowed by the tombstones will be ignored and therefore not reach the resulting table. Uh, considering more specific example of the merge process, here, for instance, we have a record key, Alex, uh, written with the timestamp 100, and on the later stage, updated with the, with the new phone number and the timestamp 200. And the resulting table will use an updated value for the key, obviously. And the record um, with the key John here gets deleted as, at the later SS table, and it gets discarded in the, in the result. So it's just not appearing over there. The two other entries are taken as is because um, they're not shadowed or uh, modified in any way. So because SS tables are immutable, they're written sequentially and um, hold no reserved empty space for in-place modifications, the insert, update, and delete operations would have to uh, rewrite the data on the disk in order, like rewrite the whole file in order to just remove or overwrite one thing. Of course, it would be completely unreasonable to have it so. So all operations modifying the database state are buffered once again in this memory resident table 
over the time, the amount of disk resident tables will grow, obviously, because uh, the data for the same key uh, will be located in several files, multiple versions of the same record, the redundant records which, which are shadowed by deletions will be there. So you will have a lot of things which you will simply discard while reading. And reads, read operations will get more and more expensive over the time. In order to reduce the cost of reads, reconcile space occupied the shadow records and reduce the amount of uh, the disk, disk resident tables, the LSM trees require a process that um, can read complete SS tables from disk and merge them in a manner that we just discussed. Uh, this process is called compaction. As we discussed, the SS tables are sorted by key um, and compaction works as a merge sort. This operation is extremely efficient. Reads are um, did from several places sequentially. Merge output is appended to the resulting file also sequentially. Um, and uh, as we discussed, it also uh, can work for the data sets that are not fitting in memory because we're only holding one record per SS table in order to merge them together and write them back on the disk. And uh, obviously, the uh, resulting SS table also has or preserves the order of the original SS tables. During this process, merged tables are uh, merged SS tables are discarded and replaced with their compacted version. After compaction is done, the amount of SS tables on the disk is reduced, which makes reads uh, more performant again, or because they have to address less tables on disk. And uh, uh, you can see that, for instance, like you can start with the several m memory tables that are getting flushed on the left. And when threshold is reached in the middle, we start compacting the lowest level into the larger SS table. So we are merging them together. And out of several files, we're making one. And then we are taking the SS, like resulted compacted SS tables, and there we're merging them again. And this. Um, process is continuing recursively for pretty much the life cycle of your data, so pretty much forever. In order to summarize it, the first and foremost, the good thing to remember about SS tables and LSM tree storage is that they are immutable. So this is an immutable storage. SS tables are written on disk once, are never updated, compaction is used in order to reconcile the space occupied by removed items and uh, the shadowed items with the later timestamps. Uh, the merge SS tables are discarded and removed from disk uh, after a successful merge uh, of the compaction process. They are, as we see, are optimized for writes because writes are buffered and uh, flushed on disk in a sequential manner. And uh, um, it also helps to uh, maintain the spatial locality of the written data on the disk. Reads, however, might require a little bit uh, more work than in other uh, storage formats or storage systems because data has to be gathered and merged from multiple sources. Since the one key can be present in several uh, tables and uh, uh, it was written in different times, so we have to read and reconcile and gather this data again before presenting it to the client. And uh, it requires quite some maintenance. and. Uh, We've seen also, because uh, we had to work a lot with the LSM storage, so there are um, places when working with LSM has kind of become tricky. For instance, the heavy workloads can saturate the I.O. Uh, use, using it just for uh, disk and flushes, or uh, um, excuse me, for uh, reads and flushes. And this stalls the compaction process. And because the compaction process is stalled, reads are becoming more and more expensive. And you kind of have the cycle of, um, well, not being able to recover. So the database gets uh, slower and slower over the time. Obviously, this, is, this can be easily uh, solved by just adding a couple more nodes into your system. And uh, it's just something that you have to look out for. The other data structure or other storage approach is a B-tree. Uh, the B-tree is, is a popular, super popular indexing data structure or uh, storage data structure, storage system, uh, coming in many variation and used in many databases. For instance, uh, MySQL in ODB is using it, PostgreSQL is using it, and even many um, file systems are. One of the most prominent papers on the B-trees is called 
<coughs> I apologize. Um, one of the most prominent um, uh, papers on the bee trees is called Ubiquitous Bee Trees. It's fascinating, it's very interesting to read. I definitely recommend it. And it describes in a great detail several possible variants of bee trees and their applications. And bee tree is kind of a child uh, of, um, or a generalization maybe, so to say, of the binary tree. The binary trees, in binary trees, every node um, has uh, two children. So referred as a left and right child co correspondingly, left and right uh, subtrees hold the keys or uh, uh, keys and values that are less than or larger than the current node key. So one is on the left, one is on the right. In order to keep the tree uh, depth to the minimum, the binary trees have to be balanced. So this is probably one thing that every developer loves. So balancing the binary search trees, everybody does it on the interviews, right? Uh, and when randomly ordered keys are being added to the tree, uh, it's natural that one side of the tree is going to get deeper and deeper over the time and the other one maybe is not going to get so deep because it is impossible uh, that the random data will create you perfectly balanced tree. Otherwise, uh, well, it would be too good. And one of the uh, ways to rebalance the binary tree is so-called rotation. And you rearrange the nodes by pushing the parent node um, of the longer subtree down below and kind of pulling the child up, effectively placing it instead of its parent. So for instance, on the um, slide here, you can see an example of rotation of binary uh, tree. So on the left, the binary tree is unbalanced after adding the two in the very bottom. In order to balance it, uh, the three is used as a pivot, right? And the tree is, around, uh, is rotated around it. Uh, the five, the previously root node, um, and the parent for this three, the pivot, becomes a child node. And after the rotation is done, the height of the left subtree is decreased, and the height of the right subtree is increased by one. And therefore, the maximum depth of the tree has decreased. So we kind of like flattened it a little bit. And uh, um, to summarize, or uh, to give you kind of a rough idea about like bee trees uh, uh, as opposed to the binary trees. Um, binary trees are mostly used for in-memory data structures because of the balancing step. Because, well, we need to keep the depths of all subtrees to the minimum, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, because we just have two pointers per node, um, they don't really work or scale very well on the disk, or that would be kind of unreasonable to have them on a disk because uh, of uh, the overhead. The V-trees, however, allow storing more than two pointers per node and work extremely well with block devices by matching the node size to the page size, which is often like around 4K. And some implementations today, some uh, use the larger node sizes, but uh, they always operate with the multiples of the page size. And B trees have the following properties. Well, first of all, they are sorted. So uh, that allows uh, to do sequential scans and simplifies lookups significantly. And they are self-balancing. So that means that they require almost no, or they have almost no need to balance the thing. Well, we will get back to the almost part slightly uh, later. So when the B tree node is full, it's split in two instead of rotating. And when the occupancy of the neighboring nodes falls down to th the certain threshold, the nodes are kind of merged back together. This also means, or uh, leaves, um, this also means that uh, uh, leaves are equally distanced from, distant from the roots. So there is no place in the um, B tree that is going much lower than the rest of the tree. Uh, they also guarantee the logarithmic lookup times, which makes them a good choice for the database indexes where lookup times are super important. They're also mutable as opposed to the previous data structure that we discussed. So insert, updates, and deletes, also subsequent splits and merges are perform performed on disk in place. In order to make an, uh, the in-place updates possible, a certain amount of reserved space as an overhead is required. The B trees can be organized as a clustered index if you're familiar with the concept where actual data is stored together um, on the leaf nodes 
Or, for instance, you can use it an, as an unclustered uh, index with the pointers to the heap file in things. For instance, slightly similar to the separation we've seen uh, with the index block and data block uh, of the SS tables. Here, uh, we are going to be mostly talking about or uh, discussing the uh, B plus trees, which is a variant of uh, uh, B tree. Uh, and this variant is uh, different in that uh, it has additional level of leaf nodes on the very bottom, and data can be stored only there, because in the original paper about B trees, the data could have been stored on pretty much any level uh, of the uh, B tree, not only on the very bottom one. And of course, the bottom level cannot have any uh, children more. Uh, let's take a closer look at the B trees and their building blocks. First of all, they consist of well three types or sorts of nodes: the root, internal, and leaf nodes. The root are white, and um, internal are kind of in the middle green, and uh, uh, the leaf nodes are on the very bottom. And uh, a root, of course, it's kind of easier to understand. It has uh, no parents, so. It, it is not a child for any other node. Internal nodes are the ones which are in between the leaf ones and the top root one, the uh, parent, and uh, they're kind of connecting uh, everything. And leaf nodes carry the data and obviously have no children. And B trees can be characterized by their, first of all, branching factor, which is one of the most important things. Uh, the, this is the amount of the pointers to the child nodes. Along with the pointers, um, uh, root and internal nodes ha hold the keys by which you can distinguish like which uh, child you have to navigate to. The other thing that B trees uh, are characterized with is occupancy, which means how many pointers to the child items the item is uh, the node is currently holding uh, out of the maximum available. For example, if the tree branching factor is 100 and node is currently holding only like 50 then we can say that occupancy is uh, 50%. And the other thing which characterizes the uh, B tree is uh, height. So it is amount of B tree levels. So how many pointers have to be followed for us in order to um, find the uh, leaf level and finish our lookup. Every non-leaf node in the tree holds N keys, separating N plus one pointers. We will get to the details of it in just on the next slide. Leaf nodes may also hold a pointer to the previous and next nodes of the same level, forming kind of a doubly linked list so that you could traverse them back and forth uh, the way you wish. And uh, as you see in a, on the previous slide, um, nodes consist of n sorted keys and n plus one pointers, and let's discuss why this is happening. Well, first, and the last pointers are kind of exception. This is what adding this plus one thing. And um, the first and last pointers are pointing to the subtrees in which all the entries are less than and equal or larger than the first and leftmost and rightmost uh, uh, child uh, correspondingly. And uh, all the other pointers are kind of like um, s uh, t telling you that you can follow them in order to locate the tree. Uh, which is greater than the predecessor and less than or equal the successor key. You can see the invariants uh, listed out here. Uh, when performing the lookup, search starts at the root node and starts following all the internal nodes recursively down to the leaf level. On each level, search field is reduced uh, um, by the subtree following the child pointer. And the range of this subtree includes the search value. So we don't know whether the value is going to be there in the end. So we may come to the leaf node and it turns out that the value doesn't exist and we did all the work. But at least we can guarantee that this invariant is preserved. So if we will keep following it, we will find the data if it's there. When the uh, point query is performed, uh, the search is complete after locating the leaf node. If you are doing the scan, uh, you're starting wherever you well, found your first key and start following the doubly linked list of the leaf nodes in order to perform the range scan. So you can think kind of of uh, the uh, point queries as going like vertically and the range scans going like vertically first in order to locate the first node and then horizontally in order to well read out all the data that you require. On the slide you can see like uh, the 
a route to leave pass uh, uh, highlighted with the, the red color. So we basically go from the, the top and all the way to the bottom in order to locate the required node. In terms of complexity, the B-Trees guarantees logarithmic lookups because finding a key within the node is performed using a binary search. And uh, binary search is uh, quite easily explained in terms of uh, searching inside of the dictionary, for instance. So uh, words are sorted alphabetically, you open the dictionary in the middle and uh, start searching, and um, if the search letter appears earlier alphabetically than well, the page that you have open, you have to continue searching left, well, otherwise you have to continue searching right. And each step reduces the remaining range in half, and um, um, therefore making the uh, lookup time logarithmic. For instance, if you had uh, a search space of 10 to the 9, then you would be able to search it within um, 30 comparisons, which is actually pretty good. Uh, when the item is found, the corresponding pointer is followed in order to locate this, uh, the subtree. Now let's talk a little bit about um, well insertions and deletions and how they work uh, in contrast with whatever we discussed um, w about Alice Andrews. When performing insertions, we have to first locate the target leaf. So we have to still follow the uh, search process, which, well, actually doesn't have to be done uh, in case of LSM trees, because basically uh, there is no difference between insertion and deletion, everything, or uh, update. Uh, we are buffering everything in memory and storing everything uh, on disk, uh, well, in a sequential manner. So this is extremely difficult, uh, different here. So here we have to first find the thing or find the node that where we have to perform an insert or the update. And uh, uh, we are using the algorithm that we just discussed for that. And after the target leaf is located, the key and value are appended to it. Now, if the leaf doesn't have enough space, the situation is called overflow. And the leaf has to be split in two. This is done by allocating the new leaf and then copying half the elements to it and then a adding the pointer to the newly allocated leaf to the parent. Now, the problem is that parent, when, whenever you have updated it with a new uh, record or with a new uh, key and pointer, uh, then it may also overflow. And that triggers another update on the next level, and then may trigger another update on the next level until you reach the root. That means that whenever you reach the root, you have to grow the height of the tree. Otherwise, well, there is no more to insert. And uh, this has an implication of the fact that uh, all the growth of the uh, B plus tree is performed from the root. So you kind of like start pushing the levels down slightly. Um, this process keeps uh, trees, well, almost always balanced uh, since the uh, height is growing from the um, root of the tree. Another way of minimizing the amount of operation and uh, operation and operations ba made on the nodes and uh, amount of splits and merges is uh, uh, to um, change or pick a right strategy for the tree occupancy. The percentage of the occupied slots it can be different. So you can say that, okay, I expect that uh, my nodes are going to be filled up to 70%. So everything between 30 and 70, is acceptable for me. And uh, uh, this also means that you will, will amortize so many costs uh, for relocating like and doing splits and merges, but at the same time you will pay with all this extra space that you have to reserve for, um, for nothing basically, because it's just sitting there and waiting for the new things to arrive, which were not written yet. Besides, merge, um, besides merges, additions, and removals, the B-trees uh, may also require some balance. And this is why we were saying that there was like almost no balance. There, there is some. But um, every balancing is needed to keep the height uh, of the well, tree to the minimum, of course, and the, um, for, for the worst case scenario. And this process is m just moving the pointers between the sibling nodes. However, so there were several papers which were considering the, um, the rebalancing process harmful, and uh, uh, many implementers of the B, uh, B plus trees are saying that, okay, we're not doing rebalancing 
And well, some of us, some of people do, but many people actually say that this is not necessary. In order to summarize it, the um, uh, B trees are mutable, and this is kind of like the um, thing that probably sets the design of the B plus trees apart from the uh, LSM tree storage, um, well, extremely significantly. And they allow in-place updates by introducing some space overhead and uh, more involved write path. Although uh, they don't require a complete rewrites or multi-source merges that LSM trees require. Um, sometimes, even though I just said that uh, B trees imply mutability, some uh, B tree um, implementations are actually immutable. W uh, it is done by uh, bulk loading, so you basically just build uh, the single B plus tree in one go, so to say. And uh, um, sometimes this is also used in combination with LSM storage in order to uh, make more performance lookups for the LSM trees. They're also read optimized, so um, they don't require because they don't require uh, reading from multiple sources, and which simplifies the read path significantly. And writes and deletes might trigger a cascade of node splits and merges, as we just discussed, making some write operations more expensive, or but only some of them because the rest is amortized. There are some techniques that implementers use to well reduce this cost, such as ba batching updates, pre-allocating nodes, keeping the node occupancy low, as we discussed at all. Uh, the um, the, uh, the B, B trees are often optimized for page environments, meaning that block storage, and uh, um, which means that, for instance, with the, the NVMe storage, the uh, usage of uh, B trees, or they may may be less relevant, or they may be, we may exploit a different, uh, more optimized data structures for that. Uh, mutable implementations, as we said, uh, require some um, overhead in order to perform in plates uh, updates and removals, and sometimes you may get some fragmentation caused by frequent updates in different places randomly across the tree. And uh, of course, whenever you have to perform concurrent reads and writes with the B trees, you have to grab a bunch of lags and latches in order to isolate uh, the writers from the readers. Now, kind of, let's try to bring it all together. So we discussed one approach and the other, and they obviously have some uh, trade-offs. And uh, some people wanted to optimize for reads, some people optimize for writes, some have more overhead on memory, some less. So what is going on even? When developing a storage system, we're always confronted with the ch same challenges. So everybody has the same problem because like, we are limited by the physics. And making the decision about what to optimize for has a substantial influence on the result. One can spend more time um, doing writes and uh, uh, lay out the data structures so that they would be more efficient for reads. You can r reserve extra space for in-place updates and facilitate faster updates. You can buffer data in memory and ensure the sequential writes, but you cannot do all of it at once. This is impossible. An ideal storage solution would have lowest read costs, lowest write costs, and have no overhead. But in practice, these structures will have a compromise between multiple factors, and it's important to understand them. And researchers from uh, Harvard DV Lab uh, have summarized the three kind of key parameters that database systems are optimized for. The reads, updates, and the memory overhead. The understanding of these uh, key parameters um, are most important for the use cases and will influence the choice of data structures and the design. And they will also influence how uh, your or suitability for certain workloads and uh, will help you to tailor uh, the data structure or storage system for a specific use case in mind. The RUM conjecture that DB Harvard uh, lab students came up with or uh, came up with uh, states that setting an upper bound on, on the two of the mentioned overheads also sets a lower bound for the third one. For example, the B trees are read optimized and have less write overhead, but for that they have to uh, reserve empty space for updates. So we kind of pulled two in the one side, the third one uh, came closer to the uh, middle. Um, LSM trees have less space overhead. 
but at the cost of the read overhead um, brought by having to access multiple disk resident tables during the read, right? So these three parameters form a competing like triangle. So you have only so much thread between these three things. And whenever, wherever you pull it, it's going to influence the other two. Uh, the B-tree is optimized for read performance. Index is laid out in a way that is uh, uh, minimizing the disk accesses uh, that require, is required to traverse the tree. Um, and only one index file has to access in order to locate the data. This is achieved uh, by, well, keeping it mutable. This in increases the amplification resulting from the uh, node splits and merges, the relocation, fragmentation, imbalance, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To amortize the update cost and redu re re reduce those amounts of merges and splits, the B-trees reserve, well, additional space, and uh, this is kind of getting wasted. Uh, this all helps to postpone write amplification until the word is full. So in, the sh in short, the B-trees trade update and memory overhead for the read performance. So you can see it this way. At the same time, LSN trees optimize for write performance. So both updates and deletes don't require locating the node on the disk, so you don't have to read the data while writing it, which is the case of, uh, with the B-trees, or at least you have to locate the node where you're going to be inserting. And this is guaranteeing that sequential writes, uh, and the sequential writes are guaranteed by buffering um, at uh, um, the insert time. And uh, this comes at a price of higher maintenance costs and a need for compaction process, which is kind of a way to uh, mitigate the ever-growing price of reads and uh, um, try and to reduce the amount of the disk resident tables and things like to where we have to look for the data that we may never need. And this also re uh, results into more expensive reads. So besides the fact that we have to m do all that maintenance to reduce the amount of uh, the SS tables, we also have the uh, problem of, uh, the, of actually having to search so many tables at a time when performing the read, while having to uh, do all the maintenance. Uh, but like there are good things about uh, LS entries and there are bad things about them. It's, it's never like uh, all just good or bad. So LSM trees, what they do, they eliminate the memory overhead by not reserving the empty space, unlike B3 nodes. And they allow, for instance, things like block compression due to better occupancy and immutability. And if we summarize it all in just one sentence, LSM trees trade read performance and maintenance for better write performance and lower memory overhead. There are data structures uh, optimized for each property. Using adaptive data structures allows uh, for better performance uh, at the price of uh, maintenance cost. Adding metadata facil that facilitates traversals, for instance, like fractional cascading, will have an impact on write time and take space, but improve the read time. Optimizing for memory efficiency by using things like compression, for instance, using like gorilla compression. <coughs> or things like delta encoding and many others, um, will um, add some overhead for packing and unpacking the data structures during uh, the reads and writes, but uh, save you some space. Sometimes you can uh, trade functionality for efficiency. For example, heap files uh, and hash indexes can uh, give great performance guarantees and smaller space overhead, you, um, but they cannot do well more complex uh, uh, queries. You can also trade precisions, uh, precision for efficiency by using things like approximate data structures, for instance, Bloom filter or hyperlog log, count min sketch, you name it. And these three tunables, the read, update, and memory overheads, can help you to evaluate the database and understand uh, the workloads is best suitable for. All of them require, uh, so are kind of intuitive and easy to understand. And uh, you can just take the storage system, analyze it, and understand which of the buckets you can uh, put it into. Of course, there are other many or multitude of important things to consider when evaluating storage. I'm not trying to simplify it by saying that, okay, these are the three only things that you have to look at. 
such as, for instance, maintenance, overhead, operational simplicity, system requirements, suitability for, I don't know, a certain uh, type of pork, uh, workload, access patterns, um, and so on. This conjecture or rule of, is it kind of a rule of thumb that uh, helps you to get a first impression and give you the direction. After that, you would have to uh, do lots of testing, lots of evaluation for better and deeper understanding. And understanding your workload is actually the first step on the way to build a scalable backend. And many things vary from implementation to implementation, and even two databases which theoretically have to do the same thing. So they use, I don't know, let's say same algorithm and the same storage type. They have to perform, well, literally the same way, but obviously because of the implementation specifics and uh, like the way people interpret the certain algorithms, of course, they will end up performing differently. The databases are complex systems with many moving parts, and it is important. And we cannot just ignore them because uh, they are too important for the applications that we're building. My hope is that uh, this information will help you to kind of have a slight peek under the hood of the databases. And uh, when you know the difference between the underlying data structures and their inner doings, you can decide what's best for you. If you're interested in the subjects, there are many, many books uh, which are going into the deeper details of um, everything that I've been talking about. And these are the few that uh, I had to go through in order to uh, give you a short summary of certain things and make sure that I'm not uh, lying to you, so to say. And if you want to go deeper without having to read for uh, at least six, 700 pages books, uh, you can just uh, follow this link, and uh, uh, this link leads you to the blog post series, which have this information and much more information uh, on the subject. And that's it. Thank you very much for having me here. It was a pleasure, and hope it helps.